Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, David, for the invitation. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to the people on Zoom. Um, and I'm really happy to be here, but my, um, my health condition is, I just have to tell you this, that my health condition is not super great. I have a very, very bad toothache. So I am operating below normal capacity. And if I certainly sort of stop and have to think for a little while, that's probably the reason. So we're just going to, it should be okay. I have taken painkillers, but um, it's not, the circumstances are not completely perfect. And I just hope that uh, we will still be able to, to have this time together. Okay, um, I'm going to be showing results from uh, sort of my old project really, which was called Living Well Within Limits. Um, and so the, the, the goal of this project was to understand if we can have universal human well-being within planetary boundaries. And we, this project ran between 2017 uh, to 2023, really, by the time we were done with it. Uh, it was funded by the Lieberhume Trust. That's why they're on here. They fund unusual research in the United Kingdom, and without them, nothing would have happened. So I'm quite grateful to them. So I, I still keep them on the slide. Uh, there's other research that is continuing based on this, some of it within my group, so a lot of it within other people's groups. So it, it really sort of um, allowed other research to start to happen along these lines. And uh, so hopefully this is a, a direction that you can also, as students, take on board and think about how you would want to take some of these ideas, some of these methods, um, and take them forward in your own work. Um, okay, and I, the other thing I guess I should say is that none of this, as far as I can tell, is taken on, by, on board by policymakers. So the science exists, the research is published, um, it was the, our results were widely reported, for instance, and used within the latest IPCC report, but everybody, um, in terms of the policy space, is still acting as though what really matters is economic activity rather than human well-being, and acting as though what really matters in the world is energy supply rather than energy demand and what we use energy for. So th there's a huge gap between what we know is possible and the direction that our decision makers and leaders are heading in, uh, whether it's in the politics policy space or, um, in the, um, or in the business space. And this is a huge, huge issue that we need to face very urgently. Okay. So I'm going to do this. And I realize that there's a lot of us in here and that we, wait, no, don't do that. That's the contrary of what I wanted to do. Go, go away. No. Yeah, I can, that, that would be cool. That would be cool. It, it appears when I wanted to try. Sorry about the, the technical problems. In the meantime, it's going to get very hot in here and we're all going to run out of oxygen. Is it possible to open those windows? Yes, volunteers to open windows. Oxygen is necessary for life. And we're gonna have CO2 poisoning of our own if we just sit in here. No, no, so, so we can just move it up. If you click on the mouse, you can move it really mostly out of the way. But th this mouse is very finicky. I managed to do it before. But I mean, if, if you... Okay, okay. And if you stay there, yes. It there we go. Okay. Okay, and uh, yeah. okay. now it would be really good for this picture. But it, it will disappear when you. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, all right, we're going to get right into it. I hope it disappears. It's not really seeming to disappear. I think we need to click on it. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to give you a few slides of the climate crisis context. And normally I update these slides, but since I was so ill this morning, I didn't. But maybe this is a good reminder um, that the last time I updated this slide was in spring 2024. And we have a whole new family, mostly flooding, but also fires in Portugal, um, a family of uh, uh, climate disasters. So this just so shows some that were happening um, in Bavaria in June, uh, in Jaipur, there was this massive heat wave in India this summer. Uh, so this shows like a, a utility truck trying to spray the area with water to cool things down a bit. In Mexico, they had this mega storm that basically um, buried entire parts of uh, um, a certain part of Mexico. I think it was in the West in um, really big hailstones and snow. 
sort of buried in ice. And what, you, what this is, it's actually very sad. It's a dead um, monkey. So basically, a whole bunch of monkeys died under the snow. Uh, and so it was an ecological disaster on many levels. And obviously, massive wildfires in Canada already starting in May. So um, we are currently heading for roughly three degrees of average warming. Um, uh, the Paris Agreement obviously tries to keep de war climate warming down to 1.5 degrees. It basi the Paris Agreement is a beautiful UN document, which is a compromise document. Uh, so basically, the developing world wanted, uh, and especially the small island states, wanted 1.5 degrees. The slogan was 1.5 to stay alive. But the rest of the world was kind of like, ah, that sounds a bit crazy to us. Let's keep it to two. And so the, the document has both in it. Um, it says 1.5 if possible, definitely well below two, and that's sort of your UN compromise. We are currently headed to um, three degrees on our current trajectory. So, um, and that's something that the IPCC report confirmed uh, as of 2022. Um, okay, and what does that mean? Why is three degrees a dangerous place to go? Why is 1.5 degrees a dangerous place? Basically, we're almost at 1.5 degrees already. Why is that a dangerous place to be? Um, and I, I really like this graph from uh, the, special, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. I guess I should back up. IPCC means Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the body of scientists mandated by the United Nations to uh, synthesize the science on climate. And they, they had a special report on 1.5 degrees that came out in, 2000, in late 2018. And I like this plot because one of the things it shows is it shows the Holocene temperature range. And the Holocene temperature range is the temperature range that our planet has been in. It's actually a very narrow temperature range, this sort of pink area. Um, it's, it's only like a degree wide. And it's the temperature range that our planet has been in for the last 10 to 12,000 years since the end of the last ice age. And this is a really important thing to realize is that Humanity has been around for longer, so Homo sapiens has been around for roughly 250,000 years. But what we know as humanity, everything that we know from human culture, technology, civilization, cities, comes from the Holocene and was only possible because the planet was in this very narrow, sort of warm, stable temperature range. And um, so including the development of agriculture is entirely dependent on the stability. The reason that people didn't develop agriculture earlier isn't because they didn't want to, it's because they couldn't, because the planet was changing temperature, being too cold or too, uh, or too hot. Um, and we're basically, we've already shot out of the Holocene at a speed that is breathtaking in, term, in geological terms. Um, so probably the last time we were in the Holocene was probably around the, 19, the 2000 teens. So less than 10 years maybe, but we're already uh, far outside the temperature Holocene range and this is very different very dangerous. Um, the fossil fuel industry knew about this, that we were on this trajectory for decades, despite all the disinformation and denial they put out into the world. And this is really important to understand. There's an excellent new paper by um, uh, Supran, Ramstorff, and Ereskes, which came out in Science in early 2023, uh, showing that um, the industrial climate models, uh, the industrial um, climate models that were developed by the fossil fuel industry itself, in particular Exxon at the time, now ExxonMobil, um, were very, very accurate in terms of the predictions they made. So Exxon had teams of climate scientists, they were running climate models, uh, the fossil fuel industry knew about climate change since the 1950s, um, we have proof of this, and, uh, and they basically developed these climate models that are super accurate. And so the point is that we are in the future that they knew they were driving us into. So they knew, you know, 40 years ago that this is where th they were wanting us to go and this is an industrial creation, right? So that's one of the things to understand about our current time. And the fact that they then put out lots of disinformation and denial is um, in accordance with their business model, let's put it that way. So what does this mean for research? What does this mean for action? Um, we need to change trajectories extremely fast. So extremely fast because we need to get emissions down to zero or close within a couple of decades. Um, and that's unprecedented in terms of scale of change uh, for an industrial system, right? Uh, and the, it turns out that the fastest and surest way to do that is to reduce consumption. If you stop using fossil fuels, 
you don't emit greenhouse gases, you don't emit CO2. We can talk about agriculture as well. Um, actually, the, the implications are similar, but it, you just replace fossil fuels with um, animal-based agriculture. So reducing consumption doesn't require as much new technology or infrastructure. We can do it fast, but the question is, how can we do it while, while preserving or even enhancing well-being? The risk is, if our, life, our, our quality of life, if our health depends on a certain level of energy use, then reducing energy use puts people at risk, and putting people at risk is bad. So we need to understand, the nice thing to do would be to understand how we could do that. Um, the problem is that up until recently, um, uh, pretty much nobody has been funding this research. I would say the, pretty much the entirety of the funded part of this research has happened within the last 10 years. And, uh, though, and, that, and I'm talking about two projects. So now there's maybe a bit more. Okay, so I need to tell you a few things about energy and well-being. The first stylized fact, just so that you sort of know what we're talking about here, is the high plateau. Beyond a certain level, energy increases do not result in measurably higher well-being. And we know this since a long time. In 1974, the year I was born, because I am old, I am 50 years old, um, Mazur and Rosa wrote this beautiful paper. You can read it. It's very nice. It's still lovely. It's still correct. Called Energy and Lifestyle, and uh, massive energy consumption may not be necessary to maintain current living standards in America. Shocker. Okay, so, and they're absolutely right. And globally, what this looks like, and I need you to know the topic of the axes, but the actual quantity, the actual unit doesn't matter. You have well-being, here measured as the Human Development Index on the vertical axis, um, energy use per capita, here represented as electricity, but again, any kind of energy use will do the same trick for you. And you have this shape of this curve, which is what we call a saturation curve. You see that um, the Human Development Index goes up very fast. You have a very, very steep slope at low energy use, where every little increment gets you a, a large amount in human development, and then over here at the top, it just doesn't matter anymore. You sort of max out. And you have like large orders of magnitude differences here. Um, so that's interesting. Um, the second stylized fact on energy and well being, and this was sort of my first result in this area um, already um, 14 years ago, uh, published, um, where what we measured is we measured the energy threshold associated with any given level of well being. And we found that, if you look at that, it decreases over time. The energy level associated with high human development keeps crashing down over time. It is moving extremely fast, and it continues to do so today. Um, so in 1975, high human development corresponded to roughly like 110 gigajoules per capita. By the time we were measuring things, uh, I guess our last data point was around 2005. It was already down below, um, down to 50 something. So it crashed by a factor of two in um, uh, 30 years. And it's still crashing down. So this is something that's really important to understand is that we are no longer in the world that we lived in even prior to 1990. Prior to 1990, you could argue there is not enough energy consumption globally for everybody to have a high living standard because everybody, or to have high human development because international energy use is sort of here. It's around like, you know, it actually hasn't been moving that much, it's somewhere between 60, 70 gigajoules per capita. Um, as of sometime in the 1990s, we start being in a different situation. We're talking about the reason that not everybody in the world has high human development is a distribution problem, not a quantity of energy used problem. Okay? And the third stylized fact, well, I'm actually not going to go into the third stylized fact. We're going we're gonna to move along. Okay. So if we wanted to go beyond stylized facts, uh, we, need a new f we needed a new analytic framework. Those studies I showed you before, uh, basically you take global economies or societies, uh, countries, you throw energy into them, you measure that, you measure well-being coming out the other end, you measure that, and the what's in the middle is a black box effectively. So it's sort of a black box analysis, so we need to go beyond this black box. And so we developed this analytic framework for the living well to basically to be able to do this research. And what we're looking at is we're basically considering the fact that we have biophysical inputs connected to planetary processes. We're still going to be looking at energy, but in theory you could do this kind of research with 
any kind of resource use from you know, rat land, water, et cetera. Um, some people have already started doing it on materials, which is great. Um, on the other side, you have your social outcomes. And one of the outcomes is well-being. And before that, you have need satisfiers. So the reason we're, we have this kind of structure here is because we're using a certain theory of well-being, which is called the theory of human need, um, which is something we had to read about and learn about and decide that we wanted to use it. And I might tell you a bit more about that in a second. And in the middle, we wanted to have basically economies, societies. And we describe these as provisioning systems. So, and provisioning systems are an object of heterodox economics. Uh, they have both physical and social components. And the main thing we didn't want to do here is we didn't want to limit the middle to technology and economy. We wanted to include social factors. We wanted to include distribution. We wanted to include power. We wanted to include culture, norms. We wanted to include supply chains. We wanted to include a whole bunch of things. And to study social and technical systems in an integrated way, which is something only provisioning systems within heterodox economics really allowed us to do. OK. So I have a PhD in physics. We do not study this. We do not practice it. We do not like understand well-being very well. This is not something that we are trained to do. So we had to go and learn and read stuff, OK? And it turns out that studying and researching well-being is extremely undignified because it means picking fights with people who've been dead for thousands of years. And um, so uh, the first sort of track that we thought we could find was in ancient Greece, where people wrote very explicitly about their theories of well-being. Now, there will be other traditions that will be important as well. We didn't go back to those. There will be also um, really interested in like non-Western traditions and indigenous perspectives as well. However, we had this is where this is where we sort of um, uh, started and uh, and tried to understand what was going on because it's quite interesting. There's conflicting, really sort of conflicting, contrasting views from Greece already that are still with us and still uh, sort of dominating the way we think about this. Okay, so Aristotle shows up. And Aristotle says, well-being, I'm paraphrasing, this is a cartoon version of philosophy. Well-being means being able to live a life as fully as possible and flourish within one's society. So it's this idea of flourishing and it's social, okay? Now, Aristotle, very interesting dude. You gotta understand that he's writing this in the ethics. A few pages before, he talks about slavery being justified, and a few pages after, he talks about women belonging in the kitchen. Everybody is problematic, okay? We're not. Anyway, Epicure um, well, has a, uh, came around a few decades later. Well-being means achieving the most positive and least negative feelings possible. And you might actually recognize Epicure's version of well-being as sort of this force field, like you're trying to maximize your integral of positive feelings and minimize your integral of negative feelings as sort of the kind of th thing that we think about well-being now. It's very, it's emotional and it's individual. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of um, Epicure. And as in all good academic disputes, the two camps persist to this day. If you ever get into academia, if we still have universities by the time you graduate, which I hope, um, uh, you should always keep an academic dispute going as long as possible. You will get lots of citations that way. And this one's been going for thousands of years, so well done. And you have to choose a team because these teams are incompatible. And this is where I should say, if there are any philosophers in the room, this is a cartoon version. Epicure did not actually believe the stuff that Epicure's ideas turned into, okay? So just understand that. Um, but the, if you're on Team Epicure, you understand well-being to mean happiness. It's an individual perspective. You use this either the happiness indicator, which is something that people measure internationally. It's a robust indicator. It's a data point. You can use it. Um, people go around and ask people, like, how happy are you from a scale from 1 to 10? And people answer, and you average it. And, okay? and your view of the economy is that more income means more consumption, means more consumption, and via utility, more positive feelings. So the more you consume, the better it is. Economic growth is awesome. OK, if you're on Team Aristotle, you see the world very differently. Um, well-being means flourishing. It's a social perspective. You tend to measure well-being then in a multi-dimensional perspective. 
uh, examples would be the Human Development Index, which you can aggregate, but it's still representing different dimensions of well-being, like education, life expectancy, and economic um, uh, security. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are also multidimensional. So it's like, you need a bunch of things to be okay, and then you can have life plans. And uh, the view of the economy is very different, so coming from Amartya Sen, um, which is that economic development should support human flourishing. It should support human potential. The economy should be there to help people do the stuff they want to do in life and have life plans and do stuff, and um, it shouldn't just grow for its own sake. And as you can tell, we actually decided we were Team Aristotle, and we wrote a bunch of papers about it so that you wouldn't have to go back and read the originals. So that was nice of us. Just going to see how we're doing for time here. OK, we're good. OK, so then um, this version of it, where you have well-being versus need satisfiers, we based upon the theory of human need of Doyle and Guff, uh, which is published, a book published in 1991, where you have these things that are considered universal need satisfiers. And what that means is that anybody, anywhere, anytime um, should recognize those things as being foundational to their flourishing. And you might not have had them, but if you don't have them, you are harmed. You will have less ability to make life plans if these needs are not satisfied. And, uh, and then the point is then after that, you should be able, once your needs are satisfied, you should be in a good position to have well-being. That's sort of the idea. So we decided, as quantitative researchers, to test this. And so we decided to look for um, evidence of this. And I'll just show you this plot, where basically we used a subjective indicator, one of these 1 to 10, well, in fact, in this case, it's 0 to 10 indicators of average life satisfaction versus human need satisfiers achieved. And um, so basically, all the countries that had 0 satisfiers of human needs achieved, we put into one bucket, and we averaged their life satisfaction. All the countries that had one need satisfier achieved, we put them in a bucket and averaged their life satisfaction, and so on. And what you can see is that it is a very, very strong relationship. And we have more recent results that I can't show you yet. They're not yet published. We hope to submit them like this week. Um, but basically, this is true. So if you want people to be well, even from a happiness perspective, even from a life satisfaction perspective, targeting need satisfaction is probably the best route you, you can have. So targeting multiple, multi-dimensional human needs is the way to achieve well-being. Um, so we think we have very, very strong evidence for that. OK. Uh, OK, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip over this. And I'm going to go straight into, um, well, I'll basically just keep this one. Um, we basically measured, uh, uh, sorry about this. This is a very complicated plot. You know what? Um, basically, no country currently satisfies human needs within planetary boundaries. If you know about Kate Rayworth Donut economics, we're not in it. People are, the countries are either way beyond. Um, so if you look, these are planetary boundaries transgressed. So this is planetary boundaries here. The more you, so there's a whole bunch of countries that are transgressing a whole bunch of planetary boundaries. Um, you have well-being here, so social thresholds achieved or needs satisfied, needs satisfied basically. There's, and so there's a whole bunch of countries that are doing well, like France is here, basically. Like they're doing well in social indicators, but terrible in planetary indicators. There's a whole bunch of countries that are doing great in planetary indicators, but terrible in social indicators. And there's a whole bunch of countries that are doing terrible at both. Like this is possible. You could be destroying the planet and miserable. <laughs> very, very bad social organization going on here, OK? The, the part of the plot that is relentlessly empty is high well-being, no planetary destruction. That is the neighborhood where nobody lives right now. And then our job becomes, how do we get there, OK? And that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. OK, now, the first thing is we have to understand inequality. Because what I just showed you on the previous plot are national averages. And national averages hide a lot of crimes, OK? Like very poor people, very rich people, eh, who can tell? So we decided to look at inequality. And so this is one of the uh, first papers that was published from the Living Well Within Limits project. First author is Yannick Oswald. Um, and basically, we did a whole bunch of things here. It was awesome. Uh, so we looked at inequality 
and energy footprints. That means we're taking trade into account. We looked across countries, so we have like um, something like 85 countries, but it's all the big ones. And uh, so it's like 90 plus percent of human population and of the economy and so on. We looked within countries. So within each country, we have a bunch of different income groups. And within those income groups, we have their consumption. So we know what they're using energy for. So we have lots of dimensions here. We have the country dimension. We have the income class dimension. We have the product dimension. And then we decided to map the product country categories. And this is something, these are really patterns we see all over the world, like across the whole world. We have products that are consumed more by rich people. They're up here. If you're an economist, that means they have an, elasticity, an income elasticity of consumption above one. Okay, that's the indicator. Co products that are disproportionately consumed by poor people are down here. Um, now, rich people consume more of everything. So this is a question of fraction within the budget. These are things that take up a larger fraction of the budget for poor households. Um, as opposed to a larger fraction of the budget for rich households. Okay, then we have less energy per dollar spent and more energy per dollar spent. And the reason that food is here, despite its environmental impacts, is because we're looking at energy. Food does not contain a lot of energy uh, embodied in it. Lots of other terrible stuff. Okay, but this is energy, so, okay, so, and we were really interested to see what was in this quadrant, the quadrant of products that are over-proportionally consumed by rich households and have terrible environmental impacts. We are really curious. It turns out it's so easy. Um, all the transport ca categories are in here. Only transport categories are in here. So basically, rich households the world over over-consume. They spend their excess income on transport. All kinds of transport, whether it's cars, heavier cars, more frequently used, longer distances, uh, more flights, etc. More public transportation as well, actually. Um, what is down here, heat and electricity, um, that's energy used in buildings. And this is consumption that poor households do not want, right? They do not want to be spending a large proportion of their income on heat and electricity in their dwelling but they have to for their comfort, for their, for their quality of life. Um, and so that means that we have basically different types of policies we should be doing here, like taxing and regulating, because this, is, this problem is not green growing its way out of existence, it's just getting worse and worse. And here, we have to invest, we have to have public investment in efficiency and low carbon generation. Because these households, the poor households, cannot retrofit their houses by themselves. They cannot invest in low carbon energy by themselves. They're poor. They don't have the money for this. So we, this means that you need a very different way of doing things. Is this globally or? I'm sorry? Uh, no, I'm just seeing the countries. OK, never mind. Sorry, yeah? Also, I didn't understand how public transport is consumed more by, by rich people. It's also consumed on general, in general, rich people consume more of everything, including public transportation. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Um, OK. Um, all right. And I'm going to skip over this, because it's basically just confirming this. Um, so globally, we know that inequality is a huge problem for climate. I'm also going to skip over this, but I'm going to show you uh, this one. So this is a study that Mar that's, again, from the, the Living Well Within Limits project, published in 2023 from the PhD of Marta Baltrushevitz. Uh, it's done for the United Kingdom. And it's looking at not just the, just time income classes, but actually individual households. And then these individual households here, they're categorized in uh, income brackets. So they're in deciles. But we start with the individual households. And what you can see is that um, so this is the poorest decile, the top, the richest decile, and this is what their energy footprints are spent on, basically. Um, and housing is this one. And you can see this thing within the UK. I mean, this, the UK is kind of crazy. This is so super equal. In, some, in most countries, you would see like some increase here. But in the UK, because the UK is crazy, you don't. Um, I can go explain later. But so the point is, you see this phenomenon of housing being super equal. What's happening here, where does the inequality show up then? This is cars, and this is flights, right? 
And so you really see transportation being the, way, the place where energy inequality really manifests itself. And this is why it's really important to look at demand. You have to look at what people are actually using resources for in order to understand what's going on. Uh, the UK is so extreme, but I bet France is not far off or other countries are not far off. We just haven't done the research there yet. Uh, is that the richest 10% use more energy on flights than the poorest 20% use total. So that's fun. Okay. So then we decided to look at what factors enable or disable societies from achieving well-being at low energy use. Some societies do better, some societies do worse. At various levels of energy use, we're trying to understand this aspect of the provisioning systems I showed you already many slides ago. And um, what this study does is, again, we're looking at energy, we're looking at need satisfiers internationally, and we're deciding to look at, so, okay, should, and it, the, so basically if you're, doing, if you're doing the math, this gives you two, two variables, right? You're trying to explain need satisfaction using energy, but it'd be interesting to understand more about what's happening in the middle here. So we have our provisioning systems, and we add a provisioning system variable, but then we also add an interaction term. And the interaction term is really important and interesting. Um, and I should say this is from the PhD of Yefim Fogel. This was published in 2021, and it was included um, quite prominently in the IPCC report through no fault of mine. Um, so the interaction term is very important because it gives you domain of validity. It tells you where your result actually matters and where it kind of doesn't matter. So, uh, so it, 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 was a, it was a very nice study. And um, I'm not going to get into what we did in the math. If somebody's interested in the method, we can go over it. But basically, we found some positive factors. So we found some of these provisioning factors, some of these socioeconomic or sociopolitical factors that were super helpful, that if you had a higher level of those, you would achieve well-being at lower energy levels. And the positive factors were public services. Public services are huge. If you only remember one thing from this talk is that public services are the key to solving socio-ecological problems, okay? Public services allow people to be well at low levels of private resource use, and they're very efficient. So public services are massive. If you have more equality economically, that's also good, bonus. And we can under, um, democracy turns out to be quite beneficial. And anything to do with electricity access, sanitation access, and in general, access to networked infrastructures is really important. So whether it's transportation infrastructure, um, communication infrastructure, we also, so, so basically, uh, and that's I guess the physical aspect of the public services like health uh, education and so on. Okay. Then we also found some, we found some factors that didn't matter at all, which I'm not going to tell you about because they're not so interesting. But we also found some negative factors, uh, and we found two of them in particular, and they're super bad. Okay, so then these are the ones that are making it harder for us to achieve high levels of well being at low levels of resource use, okay? And the first one is extractivism. Now, extractivism means that your economy is highly dependent on extractive industries like mining, fossil fuel extraction, um, um, and some uh, agriculture is also an extractive industry. So extractivism is terrible. Okay, it's really bad. This is an economic result that has been known for decades. It's known as the resource curse, it's known as Dutch disease, and it's known as Baumol's disease. It has at least and we know why it happens, but we just see it, we definitely can confirm it and see it show up in this data. Uh, the second one, which we're actually kind of surprised about, even though we're degrowthers, is economic growth above a moderate income is very bad. So basically, ec economies that pursue economic growth when they're already above a, mo a moderate income are uh, doing worse at uh, this stuff and at achieving well-being at low energy use. Um, then we decided uh, to model a hypothetical world. Uh, so we decided to see what we could do if we could model a low energy and high well-being future, just like everything I've shown you so far has been data, like real reality around us. So we decided to go into speculation and see, let's see what we could model in a, in a different world. So this is based on 
the Decent Living Energy Framework of Professor Narasimha Rao at Yale. And I really recommend that you look at his work if you're interested in this. Um, so basically, what his framework does is it connects need satisfaction to sufficient levels of energy and material services. In this case, we're looking at energy services, but you could also use material services. It's a globe, or so our model is global. And one of the things we do is we take into account technology improvements on the demand side. We're basically saying, OK, what's an efficient laundry machine going to be able to do? An efficient fridge, an efficient communication device. So we're basically projecting into the future, saying, where could we be with efficiency on the demand side? Um, you know, efficient buildings, uh, cooling, heating, etc. We have equal distribution. So the point is, everybody gets decent living standards, and nobody gets anything more. However, decent living standards depend. It depends if you're a child, you get need less food. If you're in a rural area, you need more transport. So it's definitely, it doesn't mean equal levels of resource use, right? The decent living standard is the service that you get, depending on your circumstances. If you're in a cold area, you need more heating for your thermal comfort. If you're in a hot area, you need more cooling. So it's not equal energy use, it's equal service delivery. That's important. OK. And then we get lower levels of energy demand. Um, the model sort of looks like this. Uh, you basically have the things you need for decent living standards. That somehow goes in, some of that is personal consumption, which then has a public aspect. Um, but there's also healthcare and education, which has a public consumption aspect. So we're back to our public services. There's also uh, freight, office, retail, et cetera. We have both the direct energy use and the embodied energy use. And we also have the infrastructure. And Joel Millward Hopkins, who's the first author on this, spent a lot of time on infrastructure. He learned a lot about ICT and data centers and water supply and sanitation, very interesting stuff, which turned out not to matter very much in the end result, but still quite interesting. So you can look at that article and the supplementary information. And oh yeah, and this is what this decent living services look like. Uh, which, you know, there's food. Um, everybody gets hung up on this one, which is much smaller than we're used to in Europe, at least. Uh, 15 meters square per person. What you've got to remember is that, first of all, this is a lot better than a lot of people, like billions of people around the world do not have this, right? Um, secondly, this is living space that's heated or cooled to 20 degrees all year round. And why did we do that? Because we were pressed for time. And we couldn't make it go like, in theory, you could go as low as 18 degrees in a cold climate, as high as 25 degrees in a hot climate, right? That, could, that would change things a lot. Then you'd end up for the same amount of energy with a lot more space. The other thing is, you don't need all your living space to be heated or cooled to that level all year round. So we're really talking about the space that you're living in. And so maybe that makes more sense. So just like, and remember, this is a preliminary study. But this is not a low-tech future. It's a high-tech future in the sense everybody has a mobile phone which given recent events, maybe we should be a bit careful about a laptop or household uh, mobility. You have thousands of kilometers per year, blah, blah, blah. OK. Um, and our results were that, basically, I'll just read this off. Uh, decent living energy is achievable at 40% of current energy use, uh, despite population growth that we take into account by 2050. So basically, when we, when we look at what's necessary for well-being, we're illuminating part of the parameter space that people don't generally look at. And we find that a possible future with much lower energy use would be possible with high well-being for all. So it's possible. That doesn't mean it's uh, probable. And I realize that I, am, I have two minutes left on my time. But I think we started three minutes late. So I'll just, uh, I'm sorry? No, no, I think that would be unreasonable because the discussion is interesting. So we're going to get there. Um, but basically, so our research results, I think, were cool. A good life for all within planetary boundaries may be technically possible. That's nice, right? Good. Um, but we're not doing it, right? We're going very much in different directions. And the question is, what is standing in our way? And so one of the things we wanted to understand as well in the project is we wanted to understand what are the things that are standing in our way. And those things have to do with political economy. They have to do with structures of power within the economy. Who's controlling what we do with the resources we have and the capacity we have? And we decided to look at car dependency because basically car transportation, private car transportation, 
is a real planetary problem that's getting just worse and worse and worse. Um, and so the headline here, uh, so, so what we're doing is we're now we're not looking necessarily so much at this. We're not necessarily looking so much at that. We're looking at the middle. We're looking at these provisioning systems. So this is really just sort of a qualitative, heterodox, economic, political economy study, right? And um, uh, what we decided to do is we decided to look at five aspects of car dependence. Evil pentagram. <laughs> I wanted to point out unless it wasn't subtle enough, right? <laughs> Good, okay. So we started with the car industry itself. Next, the industry of roads and parking, so car-based infrastructure. Land use for cars, that's urban planning. That's basically what are zoning rules. Are you forcing every single building to be built with maximum parking space? Yes, you are, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, are you making zoning like in the US such that, I mean, the US is so insane. Um, you know, such that if you live someplace, you have to drive to do anything in your life, right? Like, because zoning is so strict. You, you live one place and your shops and schools and everything is, everything is all in a, in a, in a, like miles and miles away. Uh, also, uh, fun fact, um, zoning laws in the U.S., 90% of to-be-built land is forced to be zoned for single-family homes, the most car-dependent building structure possible. And this is not because Americans want to live in single family homes, which in fact they don't. They would quite like to live in, you know, moderately, moderate apartments, high density zoning like we have in European cities. But that's not possible because the lobby of the building lobby, road lobby, and car lobby were there and made legislation such that that's the way that we live. Then there's active neglect and destruction of public transportation. I, I hope you all know the case of Los Angeles where General Motors paid for the destruction of Los Angeles' fantastic public transportation system, tram system. So we see that all over the world. And the creation of car culture where people identify with their car. Um, and so basically what we did, this is sort of, um, I would call it a sort of, if you're interested in this, I would have a look at this paper uh, by Giulio Maccioli that we wrote. Um, uh, I think all the papers I've cited are open access, maybe except for the one in Nature Energy, but uh, so you can, you can find it quite easily. And I think it was really interesting because you really see the creation of a system that's preventing us from doing the kinds of things we would want to do. And you see the industrial actors and how they're doing this, how they lobby, change legislation, change norms, change culture, so that we are pushed in a certain direction away from what we should be doing for our health, uh, a safe future, and a reasonable world. So I think, it's, uh, I think that's sort of interesting. Um, the research that I'm doing, uh, that I was doing in the Living Well Within Limits project is now continuing in uh, the real project. We were fortunate enough to receive funding from the European Research Council. Um, and uh, with these lovely people, so Yorgos Kallas and Jason Hickel as well. Um, and we're doing a lot of stuff and if you invite me back you know, next year I'll already have, we already have some really exciting results coming out, so I'm very pleased about this. Not that necessarily anyone will pay attention. Um, oh yeah, so my, all the, the slides got scrambled. Um, uh, which brings me to my last slide, so I try to end with this. Um, I think it is not sufficient to do science these days. Uh, we have to do more than that because science does not carry the weight of change. and. The thing that really, this, this article that I read by Charlie Gardner, so this is the lovely Charlie Gardner, the lovely Claire Worldly, uh, by uh, Charlie and Claire, uh, really sort of changed my life. So um, it's, you know, scientists must act on our own warnings to humanity. That's sort of obvious uh, as a title, um, that what the message is, and basically saying the scientists who alerted the world to the climate and ecological crises have a moral duty to join popular movements demanding political action. And I would go even further and say that we have a moral duty to make our own popular movements and to make our own professional movements in order to change things. Like, if you just know something that puts humanity in danger and you're not doing things to change the course of events, then you're not doing your job as a scientist. So I was part of the scientists who endorsed mass civil disobedience you know, back in 2019. We even started writing publications. So I was, this is, with, again, with Charlie Gardner and a, a few lovely other people. Uh, trying to change how universities function. So we wrote this, the role of uh, from publications to public actions, 
the role of universities uh, in terms of doing things differently because universities are not doing things differently right now. And I think the, one of the other things that's really important is that environmental protest, as you know, is being criminalized around the world. In some places, things are a lot worse than in others. Um, but there are very long jail sentences and really punitive conditions being um, imposed on people right now. And that's something that I think the scientific community, students, um, we should really be caring about. Uh, we also ma uh, managed to do uh, this piece, which was, I think, again, in Nature, uh, basically showing that civil disobedience by scientists helps press for urgent climate action. So I guess that this is a call. You don't have to take to civil disobedience yourself, but I would certainly think about how you don't just think about this stuff, but try to change things in practice around you. Um, and you can use your brains for that too. Like this is something we can study. We can see what works, what doesn't. Um, we, we don't just have to take a recipe. We can figure out our own, our own path. Okay, that was it. Thank you so much.